Vishal, it's great to have you here uh, with the DSO Princeton Startup Competition with uh, Ignite STEM sponsoring as well. And so I thought Vishal, so Vishal, Vishal, you started Stride Liquid Staking. We also worked together at Basis. You uh, joined, joined my last company and I think that's where we first met. We also went to the same high school, as it turns out. You're a few years younger than me. But I thought Vishal, maybe why don't we start with what is Stride Liquid Staking so everybody knows uh, what you're working on. And then I'd really love to go through your background and specifically, again, because we're talking to a bunch of college students here, all the decisions you made and it, maybe you can tell them kind of extra information about how you made them and why you made them that might help them when they're thinking about what to do next after after graduating. So I'll leave it to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much uh, and uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah uh, tell you guys about Stride Liquid Staking, what we do. So uh, if everyone is familiar with proof of stake, uh, but maybe we'll give a brief introduction to it. So blockchains work on like two different types of mechanisms, either proof of work or proof of stake. Uh, Bitcoin is proof of work, which means like basically every uh, couple of seconds that blockchain spits out a really hard math problem, whoever solves that problem gets some money and then the blockchain keeps going. Um, it's really inefficient and it's a, like resulting in a ton of computation, all, like really big env uh, impact to the environment, et cetera. Uh, and uh, all the new blockchains are basically doing proof of stake, which is, uh, at a really high level, basically everyone puts up some small amount of collateral, like Ethereum, um, and then they do some random computations for the blockchain that verifies the blockchain is stable. If you don't rely on those computations, it gives you a little bit of interest, and then the blockchain keeps going. This is like the predominant way uh, blockchains work nowadays, but uh, it requires you to stake your Ethereum. So you like give your Ethereum to the blockchain, it like does some computations for you, but while you're doing that, your Ethereum is kind of locked away. What liquid staking basically does is like a middleman for this locking process. So you give your Ethereum to a provider. Uh, Lido is a really big one, so let's use Lido. You give your Ethereum to Lido. Lido then takes your eth Ethereum, stakes it for you, so they run all the nodes and everything, and they give you back basically a receipt. It's called ST Ethereum. And what you can do is you can take that receipt, and you can go trade it around, you can go sell it to someone else. So for example, let's say I have 10 Ethereum. I give it to Lido, they give me back 10 ST Ethereum. I now do whatever I want with it, I hold it for like a year. I earn interest on that every day, whatever the staking yield is. And then a year from now, I can sell my ST Ethereum to Nodder, um, and I get like US dollars back. So effectively, I've liquefied my stake. So I have like the stake Ethereum, and I've converted it to this locked asset to a liquid asset. There's no good kind of traditional finance parallel to this. Uh, a few maybe analogies that, that might kind of conceptualize this. One is, uh, you, you can think of liquid stake assets as like a uh, check, checking account with the interest of a savings account or like a brokerage account with interest of a savings account. So what we think about is like, you have these funds you can trade with, but they also earn just like a savings yield or the, the risk-free yield. I, I have an analogy. Yeah. Um, all of the gold in, uh, a lot of the gold in the world is yeah. stored in London. It's yeah. in this really, really, really big bank vault. Yeah. And if you want to go and buy gold, most investors, when they want to buy gold, yeah. they don't actually buy physical gold. They buy a piece of paper that represents that's gold yeah. that's stored in, there in the, the vaults. So you're yeah. kind of like, the gold vault, but for proof of stake protocols. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. yeah. Like, and so the gold receipt were the Ethereum receipts. But we're actually not Ethereum. Uh, but okay, so now we're almost done what we do. Uh, so this is a really big business. Though. Slido is the biggest one on Ethereum. Um, they generate around $350 million a year in fees right now. It's actually the second most revenue generating protocol on all crypto uh, behind the Ethereum protocol itself. Um, so it's actually quite big. What we do is slightly different. So we do proof of stake or liquid staking as well, but we do it in a different way. So we are our own blockchain. And what our blockchain does is it connects to other blockchains and pretends to be users on those chains. And then it opens accounts in those chains and transfers funds to those accounts, stakes them, unstakes, et cetera. Um, this has a few kind of differences uh, over what Lido and other approaches do. So one's very decentralized. So the current approach re requires a lot of trust on the actual party doing the staking. You like give, you, give your funds to them. In our case, the funds are given to a, a blockchain. And so it retains the same trust properties as the blockchain, but it's also highly scalable. So you mentioned the model that uh, some of those in Ethereum, if you want to scale that to more and more chains, it's really challenging because each chain is a different environment. The way that we approach it is our blockchain is basically a user that can use lots of different chains. Um, and so you get lots of different scaling properties. Part of the thesis here is that we think the future is going to be lots of small modular blockchains, so app chains. Uh, and then so we are basically a liquid solution for app chains. Um, yeah, there's a lot of context, but that, that's where we are. We launched five months ago. Uh, we just hit... Uh, $1,000 of daily revenue today. So that's a uh, little bit of progress. Uh, but we're a very new chain. Yeah, and I think you your $1,000 of daily revenue, you're on Cosmos right now, yeah. right? Exactly. And so basically, Cosmos is 
slowly going to start relying more and more on you for their security, which is really cool. Cosmos yeah. is a very big, big protocol. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and hopefully other protocols too, uh, which is going to be really exciting. Yeah. Um, that's great, man. Well, well, that's good background. And um, maybe let's go through, again, because we're kind of at a college here, uh, your journey from college to now and, and some of the decisions that you made and, and why, you, why you made them. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in college, I was actually not uh, into crypto at all until my senior year. I was originally going to do like a PhD, either in like uh, game theory or statistics, or maybe going to finance, a little unsure. Uh, but I was graduating a little bit early. And, uh, and, and yeah. you went to high school at TJ, which is my high school. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you went to college, I think it was U Chicago. U Chicago, okay, yeah, got University of Chicago. So yeah. And you were interested in economics or something. Yeah, so I majored yeah. in math, stat, and econ. Got it. Okay, uh, yeah. But I was interested in like mostly game theory. Got it. Um, as well as like making my doing, uh, I wasn't like 100% sure. I was like trying to figure out how to take a gap year. Yeah. Uh, but then my senior year, Nader posted in our high school alumni group saying that he started this company called Basis, which was a uh, decentralized stablecoin. Um, and I had a lot of time on my hands, so I emailed saying, hey, if you're looking for unpaid labor, I'd love to kind of work, work on this. Uh, and uh, they were indeed looking for unpaid labor, so it, it was great. Um, and so I joined Basis, uh, and then ended up really liking it, so I ended up changing my postgrad plans and decided to join Basis full time, and was there until, from Basis to start to, to its finish. Yeah, um, yeah after, after, so uh, Basis kind of wound down after about a year, uh, and I went uh, into finance, traditional finance, so I was choosing between like trading or hedge funds, I ended up going to like this machine learning group at Bridgewater uh, for a little bit over a year. Um, and then uh, that group actually also shut down. So I was like over two on companies winding down. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it was a good experience and we learned a lot about uh, how to apply ML to markets. That's pretty interesting. After that, I started a small hedge fund. It was like a $20 million equity startup fund. We did like, uh, we traded US stocks and basically would bet on them. Uh, imagine there's like lots of stocks and all trade in like similar ways and they change a little bit every day. Like they trade a little bit different how you expect, bet on them reverting. But we're a very small fund, so there's, uh, you know, th this problem is much easier when you're on a small scale. So I did that for about a year and a half, then got acquired by a larger hedge fund. It's like a $300 million equity startup fund. Did basically the same strategy, but set it in the U.S. globally. Um, and I ran tech operations there for about a year and a half. Then got very kind of disillusioned with finance, and I, I, I'm happy to go into that. Um, but uh, started doing a bit more open source stuff, so started building crypto a little bit on the side, just anonymously for fun. Um, ended up really liking it, and there's something really rewarding about kind of building something uh, where no one knows who you are, but they use your code and they like comment back to your code and contribute, contribute back to it. You don't really get that experience in finance where everything is very closed, like only five people in the world ever see your code. Um, and so I ended up leaving the hedge fund uh, to jump into crypto full time, start of last year. Um, and I was looking at a bunch of different ecosystems uh, and different protocols and liquid staking I think is truly a core primitive in crypto. And it's kind of weird because it's not, uh, there's no like uh, huge parallel in traditional finance. There are, there are like loose analogies. Uh, but in crypto, I do think it's like part of the fundamental bedrock of uh, for the next generation of crypto, and no one's really building this in a cross-chain way. So that's uh, why we decided to start Stride. This is great, man, and I love the the journey from college to tradfi or traditional finance, yeah. and now into crypto. So I, it looks like to me that the transition from working somewhere to being an entrepreneur kind of happened maybe after Bridgewater, yeah, where you raised that twenty million dollar fund, and I, I actually remember that. Lawrence came to me and was like, Natter, Natter, you know, Vishal's raising a fund, and I think we talked about it, and I had no money, you know, at that sure, time. Sure. So, but uh, how did you go about kind of getting the, your partners for that and also the seed capital? Because I imagine yeah. raising $20 million isn't the easiest thing in yes. the world, yeah. right? Yeah, actually, uh, very, very slow. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't know if, I, I mean, this might be a common trope, but it wasn't, I wouldn't expect it at all. It, it kind of comes in huge waves. We spent a lot of my, or maybe, oh, sorry, I started off, uh, my co-founder was someone I worked together at Bridgewater. I, is that like, Jigger? Yeah, Jigger, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I yeah. met him, he's great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you guys yeah, met yeah, at like yeah. a party, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a small, small world. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so we were friends in college and we worked together at Bridgewater, and he actually ran a small hedge fund in college, um, uh, kind of very unique, he's a really smart guy. Um, and so when you leave Bridgewater, he was like, oh, hey, I have a few investors in my previous fund who wanted to put in like a million dollars. So we started off with that. That was like our initial capital. We spent like a few months kind of building it out. There's a lot of like upward development costs to making any sort of company, like just your coding nonstop for like a few months. Um, that's where we got built. Then it, we had like a few months of actually getting a track record. So it took us like three to four months to get like live data. And when you're very young also, a lot of people don't want to give, give you money. Uh, it's very reasonable. Like I would you know, give my money to a 23 year old. Uh, but you build a track record for a few months, it goes well. And then I think it usually requires uh, one anchor investor. So we had like a few, a little bit of seed capital from like s small investors. Then we had one guy come in who 
uh, want to put in like uh, five million. I think that really spurs people to now like, oh, someone else is putting a good amount of capital here. Like it's de risk for me. Uh, and then you kind of kind of keep compounding there. But it really it, it's a slow build. But once it starts getting up, yeah, that's great. I mean, yeah, it sounds like basically your partner Jigger, one of your partners luckily had a little bit of experience before yeah. and had a few connections and was able to get you that kind of scrapped together kind of initial capital. Then you built off of that and then you had enough that you could actually get kind of a lead kind of person. Yeah. And, and I imagine a fund's a bit different. So in a startup, you get a lead investor and then you know, maybe they're like your only investor. But yeah. in a fund, I think you know, instead of it being investors, they're called LPs, limited yeah. partners. And so yeah. you basically got a, a really big kind of limited partner and, and yeah. went from there. Yeah, That's exactly. Great. But it's actually a little bit, uh, so for, for, a VC, for a tech startup, I think you actually are often very fine having one investor. It's actually quite bad for a hedge fund because you, you want diversified LPs. Right, right. Yeah. And you want probably, I, I imagine for a hedge fund, you want them to be committed for a certain period of time so they don't just pull all their money out yeah. immediately when you're you know, exactly. doing something. And yeah. That's great, man. Yeah. And um, let me just ask real quick, does anyone have questions for Vishal or want to? Okay, we have at least one. So we'll come back to you in a minute. Let me grill him a little bit more on his background. Uh, so Vishal, it sounds like basically you had your fund and, and you, you, you got up to $20 million in the amount you were managing, and then you decided to sell it to another company, right? Mm -hmm. So what it, was that decision like? What did that look like for you? Yeah, yeah. So and it, when was this? Was this, so uh, you joined Bridgewater when? Uh, oh gosh, so 2019, I think. Let's go, so college, you graduate? 2018. 2018. I think I started basis like Jan 2018. Right, yep. I think March or April, the following year, we wound down. Yep, 19. Um, 2019. Yep. I started Bridgewater like a week after we wound down. Got it. Um, and then I was there until for about a year. Yep. And then yep. about March the following year, uh, okay. I started so the new fund. So March 2021, 2020 ish. 2020. Yeah, okay, cool. 2020. Okay, so it's March yeah. 2020. You start your fund. Yeah. You raise 20 million dollars. Yeah. And and well, so we didn't raise it all in March. It, right. Over so the next eight months. Yeah. Eight months. Okay. Yeah. So then you decided to sell it. So walk us through that in yeah. late, late 2020. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a unique situation. So when we were at Bridgewater, we had a, uh, our boss was like in charge of the machine learning group. Uh, and then he had like a kind of a rough falling out with Bridgewater. Uh, and then there was this, like, kind of a prolonged legal battle where he was trying to start his own fund, but they kind of didn't, wa didn't want him to. Um, and it took a while for that to get settled. Um, and then he settled it and they started building his, his new fund. But I think it took him time to build it kind of from the ground. He had to build all the infrastructure. Uh, and then so he reached out to like both me and my co-founder where uh, used to work for him. And then he reached out to us being like, hey, I know you guys already have this built. Do you want to come in kind of like build these strategies? We have a ton of capital. Um, and you guys can kind of just be in charge of tech and, and uh, research. And at the time, it actually was very draining to do fundraising. Um, I don't know, I, I'm sure you've also experienced this, but also operations. Like, we were probably spending around 40 to 50% of the time doing like trading and tech, and the other half either doing operational stuff or fundraising. And it, it's, it's very hard to context switch and it takes a lot of time. And frankly, it also takes a long time to build up the amount of capital where you're making a lot of money from hedge fund. Uh, you know, 20 million, you're not making very much money because you have a lot of uh, upfront costs uh, or, or like kind of variable costs with compute and stuff. Uh, and so it was a good opportunity for, the, uh, for us to kind of scale up quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. So it sounds like you had basically a mentor or boss at Bridgewater who said, hey, you know, Vishal is one of the best people I've worked with, which I can confirm uh, <laughs> from our time at Basis. And it sounds like basically late 2020, early 2021, you're like, hey, let's just, let's just merge with his thing. Yeah. And, you know, he can give you more of that guidance in a, an open setting. And yeah. That's pretty and cool. he already had a few hundred million dollars committed from uh, like LPs. And he was looking for someone just to build it. And he wanted to go to market pretty fast. And we're like, hey, we actually have everything built. We can go to market oh, in like, two months. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, yeah you yeah. guys did basically the infrastructure that he would have had to go back and spend six months on. Yeah. And, and, and initial strategies, yeah. So oh, like, that's great. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah. Um, super cool, man. And then later on, uh, you leave the fund. Mm -hmm. So so let's talk about you yeah. how you left and started to do crypto and yeah, what that yeah, was like. Yeah, yeah. So, so for, for uh, well, I was running my own fund too. I kind of switched to doing pure tech. Uh, we're a quant fund, and there's a lot more tech info at quant funds than we all might expect. Uh, and there's only two of us. And so uh, kind of quickly moved into specializations. I was doing tech. My co-founder was doing full research. And I moved to this new fund. It was a lot more tech. So we're trying to trade every country in the world. Um, and so we were trading, I think, uh, 12 markets at a time, but they cover all, all around the world. And you trade like, uh, I, I believe it, it was like 15,000 stocks a day. And so there's a lot more compute that goes into it. So it was like full time just building up compute, compute infrastructure for this. Um, it was super interesting. And I learned a lot about the kind of like better engineering practices, especially at scale. We're doing quite a bit of volume at one point in time. Um, and, and so it was really fascinating and I, I did like that part of the process. Um, and I was getting more and more dissolution with pure research. Not because it's not fun, but uh, I, I'm actually, I wonder if you went through the same experience. But if, after a while, it feels like uh, the research is kind of like a machine 
and you like know what you're gonna do, you're gonna get some output, and it starts becoming less interesting as a problem. And tech was like this whole new problem for me where I'd never really done it uh, at scale and learning all this new stuff. Uh, but uh, it's a very insular experience in that when you're a hedge fund, everything is very private. And so you can't share your code with anyone else, you can't publish it, publish it or talk about your research. I was talking to friends at funds who had done like really impressive things with tech. Uh, like I, like uh, a famous example, I think Jump is public about this, but they have the world's fastest like matrix factorization algorithm. Uh, but it's fully private, like no, no one can ever access it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so it's a little bit like you're like, oh man. And then crypto is the exact opposite, that everything's open source, everyone can see everything. Um, there's all this huge community building. And so starting to dabble in that a bit more, uh, it just kind of like really blew me away at how, how much faster innovation happens. Um, and yeah, ultimately drew me, yeah. drew me away from finance. Yeah, I mean, I also think, you know, the impact you can have mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur who's out there doing something often, you know, far exceeds finance. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's more, it's certainly more fun for me. Yeah. You know, I, I really enjoy it and it sounds like, yeah, yeah. It sounds like you're loving it too. Yeah, and, and also I think crypto is uh, kind of a unique spot right now where it's still very nascent. Like I know it's been around for a bit over a decade, but the tech is still very young and developing. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting, uh, uh, I think it's a huge privilege to be able to build a, a time when uh, all this core infrastructure for yeah. like the next wave of compute is really being built. Um, and you see these repos that are people could read to five or six years ago, but now have like millions or tens of millions of users on them. Yeah. Um, and they're built just by people figuring out for the first time and it's cool to be part of that wave of builders. That's great, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, Vishal, thank you. Uh, let's go to any questions we have. So yeah, I'm Chris. And I was interested in when you said that you've implemented the staking solution as a blockchain that communicates with other chains. How exactly does that communication work? Because, like, at least in my limited experience, it seems like bridges are incredibly challenging to, to securely implement. And often, like, I know Circle's got one right now, but their whole solution relies on it being centralized, which is kind of, you said you were looking for something that was more decentralized. Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, and, and you're 100 spot on. Like, bridges are really hard to work on, and it is probably the hardest thing what we, we work on. Um, for context, I think the seven of the largest crypto hacks have all been bridge hacks. And they actually, I think, are seven of the eight largest thefts in the world are bridge hacks, like of any type of theft, like bank or like physical theft. Um, so bridges bridge are hard problems. Um, what we do is, so we actually are the first blockchain doing this, so it is somewhat, uh, uh, it's, it's a new, new frontier to explore. What we do um, is built on top of this protocol called IBC. IBC stands for Inter-Blockchain Communication. Um, we're in this ecosystem right now called Cosmos, where basically all the chains agree to implement IBC. The way to think about IBC is, or maybe backing up one level, a bridge is just a way for two blockchains to agree on a communication protocol. So normally for Ethereum to Solana, for example, this occurs on the application layer. So you imagine you have like your actual blockchain then you have smart contracts on top of that. The bridges live on the smart contracts and the smart contract on one chain will communicate the smart contract on a different chain. And usually the problem with these type of hacks is the smart contracts themselves are vulnerable and that you have to either upgrade them or you have to have uh, some like admin or multi-sig key on the smart contract and that's where all of the hacks have occurred. What IBC is, is like an agreement between two blockchains to add this bridge uh, into the protocol layer. And so what that means is instead of living on the smart contract, the protocol itself, every block, will try to interpret incoming uh, packets and process them. Um, it does require legwork from the chain, but a lot of the work we're doing is making that easier for the chain to actually add this onto their chain. And it doesn't just give them access to stride so staking, but there are all sorts of chains adding IBC. I think last year there were 20 chains doing it, um, and already there are, I think, 55 chains right now who've implemented this. So it's like rapidly kind of expanding. Um, but what we do is um, uh, probably the most sophisticated use case of IBC, which we send a series of packets that will simulate user interactions. And the other chain agrees to interpret these in a certain way. And it's a pretty lightweight standard. Um, and as a result, they can now like send user actions to this chain. Um, and the literal way it gets sent, sorry, is our chain will post what's called a, like we post a transaction on our chain uh, that has all the relevant hashes. Um, and that's signed by, uh, we don't want to get too into the weeds of it, but signing is basically how you prove you're not lying and you are you are the chain. So our blockchain will sign a transaction, post it in our chain, then someone else who's called the relayer will just copy that and post it in another chain. Another chain will then interpret it. And uh, the relayer usually gets paid like, uh, like a penny per transaction, so they're incentivized to do it. Yeah, I think what I was kind of most interested is that relayer, because mm -hmm. I, if I understand correctly, um, kind of short of building within an ecosystem like Cosmos, yeah. um, that communication is gonna have to be carried out off chain, like yeah. between the two chains. Yeah. So a lot of the, the like people I've listened to speak about this sort of thing seem to point to that as a security concern because like there's some solutions that involve minting and burning and there's others that involve locking up tokens, but yeah. they all like, ultimately rely on like some communication that's, de that's typically centralized 
and yeah. off of the chain yeah. in order to facilitate that what that step that goes from chain A to chain B? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a good question. So I think the conventional ways relay layers are done are extremely centralized. So if you have a traditional bridge, it's like you have to post to one smart contract and another, and it has to be like the relevant admin or the multi-sig. And so no one else can post that, and it is a huge form of like centralization power. And a lot of the bridge hacks, I think, are just this this admin key gets hacked, and then they post fake transactions. Um, the, the way ours work is a little bit different. And so without getting too in the weeds of it, what we do is our blockchain A and blockchain B both have validator sets, and the all the validators basically sign a transaction as part of the block, and they'll post that on this chain. And because it's signed by all the validators here, there's no need for an admin to come and extra sign it, because you, you've now gotten confirmation that uh, a majority of the validators in this blockchain uh, have agreed on this, and there's no way for someone to fake that information because it relies on having the private keys of the validators, which generally is like hidden, only the validators will have access to it. And then because now this transaction is just a series of text, it no longer has any special meaning from like the person signing it. Um, anyone can now just copy this text and paste it onto the other blockchain, and there's no, it's not centralized, so we don't do it, like anyone can do this. And the transaction has built in a fee into it, so anyone who wants to make, like, uh, I think the current rate is like a penny and a half, anyone who's willing to copy paste this from blockchain to blockchain B can go do it. And blockchain B also has uh, a copy state of the validators from blockchain A. And so that blockchain can verify, hey, has this relayer modified this transaction? And then uh, that way you can get like basically trustless communication. There is uh, a lot of edge cases on what if the transaction fails and then go from blockchain A to blockchain B. You actually have another uh, confirmation black back to blockchain A. And a lot of the work, and similar to TCP IP, a lot of the work is how, how can you handle failures at every layer of the stack? Like any part of these packets can fail. Um, but that, that's a lot of what we work on is how can you make this very redundant? Yeah. Good I question. Mean, it, it sounds like as long as the transaction uh, doesn't get censored on its way from blockchain yeah. A to blockchain B, everything will happen. And yeah. so you can prevent that by just broadcasting it to a lot of validators and you're basically guaranteed, similar yeah. to Bitcoin or any, yeah. anything yes, else. Yeah, you, you broadcast it, but because blockchain B has a copy of all the validators of blockchain A, it can verify that it uh, was signed by all the validators. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. so you're saying that the, the blockchain you're broadcasting to in, the, in this mm -hmm. ecosystem where, yeah. where IBC is implemented, yeah. inter-blockchain communication, yeah, yeah. they actually already are getting that information as part of their consensus already. Uh, ex ex uh, so yeah. actually what happened, yeah, we don't want to get too in the weeds of this, but actually there's that. another relayer infrastructure that relays the, what's called the client state, right. which is the set of validators in this chain to other chain. That's also trustless and we can go into it, but that's like a whole rabbit hole. Love yeah. it. Um, Vishal, thank you so much for joining us. Give them a little round of applause. Thank you.